Hello and welcome everybody to Entrepreneur with the Sir. Um, if you're tuning in for the very first time, it's our episode number five and this is where I get to sit down, my name is Oscar and I sit down with an entrepreneur and we talk about all the great things that they do and what the best thing is, you get to ask questions as well. So you can log in by using the, uh, the chat system on Zoom and we encourage you to do that. Uh, today we're really lucky, I'm at Jack's Magazine which is the home of the Sawdust Bureau uh, where they do amazing furniture design. I'm actually with the director and owner of the Sawdust Bureau, Brian Cush. Brian, thank you for joining us. Okay. Good to have you here, man. Well, first of all, thank you. This is so good. Finally, for those who have tuned in many a times, as you can see, we're out of the office and in somewhere new, so I'm really excited. I want to get the conversation going and find out a little bit about where your first passion for design started. Probably as a kid, I was into art and design at school. I, um, I would have spent quite a bit of time in my grandfather's workshop growing up. Yep. So he was an architect turned furniture maker. So we made model airplanes together, the old school balsa ones. The proper of course, ones, I remember you know, them. Not just, I remember not just them. the airfix gluing them together, but yeah. proper ones that you would fly. Um, and then at school, design and technology. We didn't have woodwork at my school, quite ironically. Mm. Um, but then I took a slightly different path and went down maths and physics and that kind of background, which led into my career, which I'm sure we'll go through later on. Definitely. But, um, yeah, from a young age. Okay, excellent. And from what I understand, you've, you've traveled the world, you've been to many places. I'd love to know that experience in seeing different cultures and how has that, uh, I guess, shaped you professionally and personally? I think it's so important to not only just to travel, but to actually immerse yourself in it. So okay. I studied first in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So that was a proper old school university. It was a hard ass university. Yeah. If you were 1% below the mark, you fail and you go back and you do summer school. Wow. Okay. Um, the next experience I had was Eindhoven in the Netherlands, where it was, you had to be a lot more self-motivated as a student. Okay. So you only had limited time with your tutors. It was about getting into groups with other students and tutoring each other. Mm -hmm. um, it was a fantastic experience. Um, wow. It definitely taught me a lot about myself and my own self-motivation and yep. that I wanted to be involved in design and collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I went on to Melbourne University, did my Masters of Architecture. Um, but yeah, I think having European and Australian design experience is sort of, it's taught me a lot alongside travel, which is Almost obviously that, a bit more fun. Yeah, that best of, yeah. best of both worlds. Ah, yeah. oh, cool, cool. And then before, you know, being here and saying your own business, let's backtrack a little bit. And as I understand, you spend many years studying architecture. I did, yes. And then being in the world as a professional architect. Yeah. That you, you made the change, that, that scary change, what made you, what, what motivated you to do that? A number of things. Okay. So it was seven years study. I then worked probably four years full time for an architect in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Enjoyed the experience, enjoyed the company I worked for. So Tandem Design Studio, shout out. <laughs> um, great people to work with that I still have a working relationship with. But um, I don't know, there was something about sitting at a desk all day that wasn't for me. Okay. Um, if I go back to school, you know, sitting in textbooks wasn't my thing. Being in a workshop in design technology, that's what I got a buzz out of. Mm. So when we spent a year in Africa traveling with my wife, it kind of made me revisit a few things. Did I want to be doing architecture for the rest of my life or did I want to do something a bit more tactile? So I'm sure many architects have had the same experience, but you spend months and months detailing a building, you get to site and you see the way it's been built and a builder takes some liberties and knows best and they do things that maybe they weren't contracted to do. Yeah. Um, whereas with furniture, I know that there's several ways to do it. There's a fast way and a mm -hmm. slow way and I can tell the client you know, how much this type of detailing is gonna cost versus a slightly more complex version. Yeah. So it allowed me a bit more control over the whole design process and to watch it grow from a sketch to a CAD model to a prototype to a finished piece. It was the whole gamut. Whereas yeah. with architecture, I felt as though there's a certain point where you have to hand off and you're relying on somebody else to finish the job for you, mm. which I struggled with. It's almost like you got to run the whole journey. Yeah, yeah. it's my baby, you know? Yeah. I, I, wanna, I wanna take care of it and make sure that it's finished properly. Well, so that leads me straight on to, we're, we're here at the, the Sawdust Bureau. Tell me a little bit about this business. So I've been operating I started on a part-time basis, so it was evenings, weekends. I had a very small workshop. 
I would take a little bit of my uh, architecture salary every month, put it aside, buy the best kind of tools that mm -hmm. I could afford. So it was very, very basic to start with. It was a four meter by four meter shop. There's not much you can make in it, but it was about experimenting with different techniques, learning, going on blogs, forums, talking to people, going on YouTube. Um, there was a lot of learning rather than producing bits of furniture. So the first commissions I got were small, but the same thing, the money goes back in, buys machinery. I then got a few bigger ones, went down to four days a week in architecture, three days a week, two days a week. So it was a, it was a gradual step out of it rather than one big leap. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, over I, many years, over, you know, it was probably two years, that process, it wasn't, it wasn't over six months. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of thought going involved. And that kind of brings me to, to a, a, another question about this, I guess, that change, that pivot, if you will, mm -hmm. from one professional industry to the next. And I'm sure there's a lot of people tuning in and viewing tonight who may be sitting in that position where they're thinking, oh, I would love to be, take that step. Yeah. I'd like to know a little bit more about that actual, you know, what risks did you weigh up? What were, what were the things that were going through your head to, that made you actually go, that's it, I'm doing it? Yeah. Um, the slow step out of architecture was definitely easier than doing the big giant, I'm out, right. I'm going to do something else. So that was definitely easier. But um, yeah, I say you just have to do it, you know? You have to research. So I had a, a reasonably good idea for the types of designs that I wanted to do. I didn't mm -hmm. want to do mass production. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to just be a designer and have somebody else fabricate it. Mm -hmm. So I knew I wanted to be a maker. I realized that I had to go in at a mid to high end to kind of produce the pieces that I wanted to piece, yep. that I wanted to produce. Um, so it's, yeah, it's about researching the target market a little bit, having a good understanding for what you want to do and knowing that there's people out there that will pay for it. Mm -hmm. If there's not, there's no, there's no point in doing it. Um, but yeah, just do it, you know. <laughs> That's the advice, isn't it. it? If you want to do it, just do it. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Um, but plus I didn't really see, a lot of people questioned me and said, you know, you're leaving this very safe career yeah. as an architect, you're going to earn X amount of money. Architects are not paid that well, so <laughs> that was probably one thing that made it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I knew that I could get to my architecture salary within a few years of running my own business, mm -hmm. and I was going to be my own boss and mm -hmm. control the direction of the business, so probably a little bit easier for me uh, okay. with that. Uh, the keys, like the, the day dot that I handed in my notice was the day we got a Melbourne, um, City of Melbourne business grant. Oh, okay. So fantastic. That made a real difference. That put me probably two years ahead. Wow. Um, in terms of the cash injection and the types of machinery I could buy. So it wasn't only the cash, but it was the experience of doing it, you know, having to write a proper business plan, having to put together a document that looks professional, that yep. gets your ideas done on paper, having to put numbers together, yeah. forecasts, things like that. It's wow. a great experience. So. I would say even before you have a business, this is a really good thing to do. Go on all the city council sites, find out what grants they're offering and just, just apply. Yeah, well, great, great advice because I think for many people, they, without that exposure, that opportunity to be able to put their business plan onto paper may yeah. not exist yet. Yeah. And all the intricacies that are involved in that, it's really, really great advice. Yeah, the worst thing I can say is no. Yeah, what's, exactly. On to the next one, as yeah, they say. Yeah, next. Um, I guess then from, from that, a business like yours, Tell me how the sales and marketing works for someone like yourself. It's pretty integral. Obviously, okay. if I don't have clients, I don't have sales. If I don't have sales, I can't operate. Yeah. Um, I've tried a retail model where I sell direct to retail. Reality is retailers were making far more money out of my pieces than I was, yeah. which is fine if, if you're set up to do that and if your pieces are of a nature where you can produce them at a price point mm -hmm. where they can add on their margin. But I quickly decided that wasn't for me. So I preferred the direct relationship that I have with a customer. Mm -hmm. So I'll get them into the workshop, they'll see me, they'll see my previous work, they'll see the timbers I work with. It's not going into a showroom and just buying my piece and sort of dissected <laughs> completely from the whole story of what my business is. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think there's a real personal connection that I value and the clients value. You know, they want to see their piece grow. So. After they've come into the workshop, I'll send them sketches. Once the sketches turn into the prototypes and start being developed, I'll be posting on, on social media, on mm -hmm. Instagram, on uh, Facebook, and they'll be able to follow and engage with the piece being made. Right. So, I don't know. 
I think that like, creates a better bond with them and their product. It, so. it sounds like the journey in which the the customer, if you will, goes through with you and, and almost like they're watching their baby grow as you're, as you're doing it. That's, I think that that's a really unique, yeah. really interesting point. And I'm sure that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I'm sure that that journey within itself has allowed for additional sales to come through, additional customers to get recommended to you by, by others. It has, like word of mouth is definitely yeah. the best. Um, word of mouth and you're entering into friendship groups of your clients, they're not the ones that bother you down on price. So. Mm -hmm. When I quote a price, it's literally that is the price. I don't do discounts. I don't do sales. Yeah. That is the price. That's yeah. that's the way I work. So, if you can get repeat business and word of mouth business, it is an absolute cracker. Yeah. So yeah, keep your clients happy and over deliver. Over deliver. Yeah. Great sales. So the 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 other thing, and I you and I touch on this um, a little while ago, but you were telling me that you know often you'd actually go to the home of a potential customer or a customer and you go through that journey of them actually looking at the space, matching it up and ensuring that what you're going to create will fit within what, what within the, the room that they're actually going to put in. That's a really, it's a whole new level, I guess, of customer engagement yeah. and building something very specific to that person. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I think that's probably um, a bit of a nod to my past as yep. an architect, you okay. know, dealing with spaces and trying to work out what will fit in the space, like what the palette is, yep. whether the timber has to contrast with existing pieces that are in there or floors or the type of light. Um, I think that's a really niche part of my business mm -hmm. that maybe other furniture makers don't get. Yep. Um, it might just be an online order and they process it and deliver it and that's it done. Whereas mm. I know that that piece has to look good in the home. So, yeah. so I want to move on to, um, I guess you touched on it slightly, but let's let's dive a bit deeper into to social media for you. Yeah. Um, I guess, how important is it, is it for you as a, as a business owner? And you know, how do you get people engaged? Yeah. Um, so for me, because I do see my business as a bit of a niche business, mm -hmm. I'm realistic about it. I know that through Instagram and Facebook, I'm not just going to get sale, 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 sale. Yeah. It's about building an audience. It's about trying to get them to engage with your product. Mm -hmm. um, I see probably most of my pieces as aspirational level. So okay. people that follow me for four or five years will then start to become clients once they've you know, got a better job or qualified uh, from university and have right. expendable income. So I think it's a slow burn mm. is what's really important. And it's just about getting it's kind of like validation, Oscar, you know? So a client who probably won't buy off Instagram mm -hmm. will go on Instagram, see X number of followers, see people commenting on your work, see other makers commenting on your work. And um, that's really important as well. The bond that, that we sort of formed as a group of makers yeah. in Melbourne um, is something I didn't get in architecture. Yeah. People are willing to share ideas a little bit more. We can engage with tool companies. So mm. I've had a couple of sponsorship deals come through. Wow. with um, Bosch Australia and SawStop and people like that. So without social media, how do I, like, how do I reach them? Do I just pick up the phone and, and call Bosch and say, yeah. can I have Come some in. product please? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for a small business, it's it's vital. Mm -hmm. It really is. You know, I, and I spend a bit of time on your social media. And one of the things that I really, really love is that additional level of engagement that you have with your audience and my example of that is I know that on your Wednesdays yeah. you you know you encourage people if they have questions to send them in and you'll get back to them yeah. and I think that 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 level of I guess one people get to see a little bit more about you who they would potentially be buying off and I guess also what you touched on a little bit earlier about other people commenting other people liking your um your stuff that other designers that gives that additional layer, I guess, of credibility yeah. of what you guys are about, what you're about, and what Sawdust Bureau is about. I think that's what we were looking to achieve with the, yeah. with the Ask Sawdust series. And I kind of recognize that furniture, especially hard edge modern furniture, can be quite a somber thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that it reflects my personality. And being Irish, I have a bit of a sense of humor. So I try to incorporate humor into the videos that then reflects back into my brand that you know, I am a one mad business, but you're buying into me. You're not just buying the pieces. It's, yeah. it's a big holistic thing, big bubble. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. I guess then on that, I'd like to talk to you about something. So in front of us okay. right now, we have in 2017, as I understand it, you won the award for this piece and it's called the, the Pension Noir. Mm -hmm. And vi it was the Vivid Award, Design Award, correct? Yeah. Vivid. How is winning this award and 
for those of you who are tuning in, you can see this beautiful piece here. Has that made much of an impact on, on your business? I'd love to say that after the award, I sold a million of them. It's not the case. <laughs> um, and it probably wasn't even my intention to do it. Okay. Uh, this was a piece that I made purely for that exhibition. So it was um, an iteration of a piece that I'd made before, but I wanted to try a new technique. Mm -hmm. So I don't stain anything in my, in my business. I prefer to have the natural tones of the timber, mm -hmm. but I wanted to find a way of getting a black version without black stain. So I researched the technique called eminization, where you paint black tea on to add tannins into the wood. Black tea? Black tea. Wow, okay. So it boosts the tannin count. So this is yep. Tasmanian oak, which is a very blonde timber. Mm -hmm. So the black tea adds the tannins, you dissolve steel wool and vinegar, and it gradually ebonizes. It's a very, very slow process, yep. but there's no chemical um, stains involved. It's fully reversible. You end up with a much cleaner finish. So it's, it, for me, it was about learning that technique and mm -hmm. putting a piece into an exhibition, see how it did. And when it won, it's great. It gets you credibility. Um, so even if a, if a client doesn't want to buy this piece, they see you're an award-winning maker. Yeah. It's a good thing to say of for course. any business. But um, yeah, don't expect sale, 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 sale. I, can yeah. we just quickly touch on this mm -hmm. a little bit? I mean, it's obviously, visually, it's very stunning. Um, but you know, you said that it originally was blonde and then yeah. now it's black. And yeah. I think that what you just quickly went over with me with that, I guess that it's got the, the, the black tea through it. And I guess that level of detail, that level of like, and I don't know if this is a word, bespokeism could be, but you know, that- It is now. It is now, yeah. we're using it. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess this is, well, I, I, I could be wrong here, but I'm guessing this is like kind of the reason why you stepped away from that world of architecture to kind of do your own thing and create this type of this type of piece would i be right pretty much yeah, yeah. this was the first piece of furniture i designed was a pinch bench oh wow okay became a pinch noir eventually but i i didn't see it as that huge departure from architecture so i set out to create pieces that were mini pieces of sculptural architecture so a scaled down architecture that would fit in people's homes okay so i didn't want to just make a table with four legs and it looks like a table so that's why it kind of has this weird pinched form Right, yeah. and the the base at the bottom. Yeah, what's I, I saw you lift it before. Yeah, it looked heavy. heavy. It's what, heavy. <laughs> what is in there? So it's con it's concrete filled, and it's electroplated brass. Is the uh, there's a few different versions. Some I do that are raw concrete finished. Some polished uh, stainless steel. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, this one has the brass rails inlaid in it for the magazine um, hanging rails, mm -hmm. and then yeah, the big brass foot is the is the counterbalance. Cool. Yeah. So I think you know what would be really. I'm interested, from a business perspective, you've obviously opted to go the bespoke um, design rather than a mass production. Mm -hmm. um, from a business perspective, what does that actually mean um, to, to make that decision over you know, something cheaper that you can bang out multiple you know, quicker versions of? It means in the first few years you don't make much money. Okay. That's probably the reality of it. Yep. Um, it's about start like I start most of my pieces so if it's a limited edition piece like this I start with the price low yep. so I try to sell it the way artwork is sold so as you near the end of the edition and demand has gone up for the piece your price increments so okay trying to sell it like art rather than mm -hmm. sell it the way furniture is sold fixed mm. price this is what it is yeah and um, that's probably the difference between my work and mass-produced work mm. yeah okay so at the end of the edition you're making very good margin on it but at the start it's a hard slog Mm -hmm. And then with that, obviously, you have then a, a very different customer um, who's coming in, who's at that particular price point and mm -hmm. so on. What is there a typical customer for you? What does, what does that person look like? You'd be surprised. Okay. There is no typical customer. Um, when I'd started this business, I would have assumed it was people in their 50s and 60s, sort of empty nesters who have a bit of cash to spend yeah. and are now in a home where their kids aren't running around destroying it. Uh, it hasn't been the case. Um, I've sold from 21-year-olds to 65-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, so no, there is no one key customer. I have had a few sort of celebrity chefs and different clients like that, which it brings Hold on, together. celebrity chefs, I must ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drop names, who, who have you had? Shane, Shane Dahlia. Is, ah, fantastic. Is, is my man from, from Maha. Maha. From Maha, yeah. So fantastic. I've done a few pieces for the restaurant and a few pieces for his home. Okay. So that was probably my first real bespoke job was, yep. was for him. So he tested me with a few commercial pieces um, and then 
the piece for his home was uh, the bar that was clad in Maha was clad in um, ironbark. Yeah, right. And it was all being ripped out for the renovation. Okay. So he wanted to maintain the ironbark and have me craft a piece for his home. Wow. So it was the whole story of him buying out the other business owners mm-hmm. and he then has the table in his house that is part of the original Maha. Right. And, I, you know, the thing that comes to my mind with, with a situation like that where you, you've got this really diverse mixed group of customers, if you will, I don't know, I guess then having to, to communicate with everyone in, mm. in a way that resonates with a, with a way that they can, you know, that, that's an art form in itself. And, you know, is there, is there a rhyme and reason to the way that you do your Instagram or is it? Um, like I said, I think it's important to be yourself. Yeah. So the formal level of communication, I don't deal particularly well with. Yeah. I prefer to call customers rather than just drop them emails all the time. I yeah. like to get them into the workshop to engage them in the experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that most people respond really well to that. And mm-hmm. uh, the whole 50 emails back and forth thing, it's not me. Yeah. It'll work for other people, but it's not me. Yeah. yeah. And I think you probably get the most out of it when people were to come here and to see this and other pieces, which brings me to my next question. Obviously, the bench is the bench and we can see it's fantastic, but what are the other types of things for those? I mean, you know, you can't really see behind us, but we're actually, in a massive warehouse here, and there's, I can see chairs, I can see a light box, I can see some bits and pieces. But I'm, w- w- for those who can't, don't have the luxury of being here with me, yeah. what else What else do you make? We make anything. Okay. So my key was that I didn't want to do the mass produced thing and making the same piece day okay. in, day out. Yeah. So when you come to my workshop, I'll very rarely be working on more than, if it's a pinch bench, I might make two at a time, just okay. in terms of economy. Mm-hmm. but. At the minute, there's a pinch bench, there's a dining table, there's a set of chairs, there's a bed, and all these will go on simultaneously. Mm-hmm. So, But hop onto the website, sawdustbureau.com, and you'll see everything on yeah. there. But anything from engrained chopping boards to beds to bespoke fit-outs, anything at all. But awesome. our only rule is Australian Timbers. Australian, Australian timbers, timbers only. That was, Good rule. Yeah. Good rule. I mean... It, to me, it just seems sensible. Yeah. Like everybody else works in American walnut, American oak. They bring the timber halfway across the world. We have amazing species of timber here. Mm-hmm. And um, I see it as part of my responsibility now to nearly educate architects and designers on the species of timber that we have growing on our mm-hmm. doorstep rather than wrecking our carbon footprint and bringing stuff in from, uh, from the other side of the world. Okay. That's, yeah, it's a great mentality to have, yeah. right? Um, what, what I'd like to touch on a little bit is because I'm sure a lot of people at home thinking, so we get that he does all this amazing design, we get that he does all the, the hands-on work, but tell us a bit about the business side of this business. The business side of this business? Yeah, like how is it um, split your time? At the start, it means that you work 60, 70 hour weeks because I had no real training in, in business. Okay. Um, we did a little bit of architectural practice as part of my degree, which sort of teaches you how to run an architecture business. But running a product-based business is completely different. Trying to work out margins, trying to work out overheads, all the things that go into operating a making business is yeah. so different. So a lot of trial and error. Mm. But I would say probably 60% of my hours would be spent in the workshop. The other 40% will be admin, marketing, quoting, social media, all that kind of stuff. So it's not all rosy and just making things all day. There is a, a big side of it that's, that's away from the business. And I know it's time at a computer, but I can deal with that because it is I'm my own boss, you know, and it's not working for somebody else. So when the highs are high, the highs are very high. And when yeah. the lows are low, I have myself to blame, but I'm the one that can redirect the ship and try to affect those changes. Just just on that, the, the transition from reporting to someone, mm. having a manager, and now the flip side of that where you're, you're, you, run, you run the show, mm-hmm. What's that been like? The, the pros and cons oh, with that kind of transition? It's really hard. Okay. Because I had, I had two bosses in my architecture firm that I really clicked with. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, leaving that to suddenly, after I got my business grant, coming in January 1st into the workshop and going, I'm my own boss. Oh no, I can't do this. <laughs> um, At least I can't get fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you never know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm quite a motivated person. Um, I like what I do, so and I like the relationship that I have with my clients. So that drives me. Yeah, you know, I want to have more of those experiences. I want to. I want to make more things. I want to create new things. I don't want all my pieces to look the same. 
Um, so it's just that constant evolution of, of what my brand is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's, that's a really... Does that answer? Yeah, yeah, look, it does. Yeah. It does. I think that, you know, myself included, you know, you, you, you sit, you wake up middle of the night, you got this idea and you just think to yourself, I've been thinking about this for so long. Mm -hmm. I really want to take that plunge. Here's all the pros. Here's all the cons. Am I ready to do it? You know, it's that that kind of that back and forth. And I think I always love to when I when I sit here and I and I speak to people like yourself who've who've gone out and done it. And that, you know, often the um, it's that that sense of you know the passion for wanting to do something for their, for themselves really outweighs any kind of risk associated and the risk associated is not doing it mm -hmm. you know is does that resonate with you definitely yeah yeah you only live once mm. like if this fails i've learned a lot from it you yeah know? if if i want to start another business i now know how to operate social media i now mm. I know how to deal with margins and overheads and things like that so yeah yeah i think it's important to um just to do it like, yeah like i said so that that's that, you know that's interesting as well so i guess if we could go back in time Thinking about where we are now, going back in time and thinking if there were some fundamentals of the things I could have learned at university, yeah. you know, what are those types of things that would have made life a little bit easier today? Um, definitely parts of business management. I, like, I know you guys are in online business school, so it's always like, this is a plant, but this is not a plant, <laughs> not a plant. Um, definitely how to operate a business. Okay. Um, I mean, no matter what degree you're doing, it's such an important thing. Um, so yeah, I would have loved to have known some of the ins and outs of how to run a business. And do you, when you say run a business, is that is that all encompassing? Is that you know managing finance? Is that oh yeah, I'm talking about the real dull stuff. Yeah, like, you know how to how to Excel how spreadsheets, to file, <laughs> how to file tax Excel spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, all that really boring stuff. That at uni you might not appreciate it if it's taught. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the second you graduate and you try to go out on your own and you're trying to learn it for yourself, it takes ten times as long. Mm. Yeah. And I, you know, I've got here one of the questions is what advice can you give um, give anyone thinking about changing careers? And I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, but it's um what I'm uh, what I'm hearing at the moment. It's almost like there's this level of get business ready, get oh, yeah. prepared. Yeah. You know. You know potentially those subjects that you think weren't going to be of that much interest or the areas that you think that's a bit duller well I, you know i really prefer an accountant to to look after that yeah um but at the end of the day you need to understand where you stand financially don't yep, you totally because I, and i'm guessing here but i'm assuming that you know if you need to buy great quality timber to do this type of thing that level of understanding of where you're at financially is important yeah managing cash flow yeah wow it's tough yeah but, um yeah it's it's something you learn something okay. you learn through doing mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's true and from a techno a, a technology perspective mm -hmm. i mean i look around the room here and there's a lot of the th all the things that you would, you would think of here drop saws chisels hammers things like that is it, is there any other types of specific technology that you use as a designer as a design tool as a design tool yeah um so i still i still use a cad for most of my modeling so i can do model up pieces of furniture very, very quickly, and the software will spit out uh, cutlass. Mm -hmm. So again, it's taking part of my architecture background that maybe another furniture maker might not have, and okay. trying to take advantage of that. I can take photorealistic renderings very, very quickly. We can do 3D printed models to show a client exactly what the piece will look like. That's probably the techiest side of things. Mm. The rest of this machinery, it hasn't changed for years. You know, there's bits like saw stop and um, laser levels and things like that, but the rest of it is all pretty simple tooling. To okay. be honest. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like that though. I like that it's mm. it's still you know the real deal. Yeah, you know it's uh, it's and I, it, like I, I'm not a kind of a, I'm not a fine furniture maker. And I don't mm. see myself as one. I see myself as a designer maker. Mm -hmm. So there are people out there that will spend hours and hours and hours doing hand cut dovetails. Yeah, which I mean more power to them the patience. But I prefer to make pieces. I prefer to get pieces put together. So that's not to say that I don't use joinery that's uh, slightly more tricky than just putting mm -hmm. things together and using dominoes. But um, yeah, I know that there's a balance between the old and the new, mm -hmm. and it's taking the best of the old techniques, such as ebonizing this piece, but also the new techniques of machining and stuff like that. Cool, that's, that's interesting. The your, your growth, let, let, let's, talk about, let's talk about that for a second. Five years from now, you know, where's Sawdust Bureau? 
I've no idea to be honest. Okay. Um, it's not really something that I think of. Yeah. Um, I'm not a kind of a person that sits down and writes six month goals. Yeah. Um, I mean, for all I know, I could get the biggest job in the world next week, or I might not have work for the next month. Mm-hmm. So I think this whole sitting down and writing goals is not what I'm about. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to grow into a large business, and then I I would kind of feel as though I've got back to the situation of architecture where I have to hand over things. Yeah. And I like to be hands-on yeah. in making and designing. And I think if I was just a face of a business having to run it from the background, I would feel as though I've lost my business. Yeah. So a small team of real dedicated designer makers would be ideal. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all I'd want to be. Mm. That's, it's really interesting because so many, when you think, often when you'd ask someone about their, their business that, you know, and they're talking about where do you see it next amount of time, the, the response is often around growth expansion how do i scale up yeah. right um ha, ha, it, all those types of things whereas because what you do is is it's very much it's 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 that personal touch that's required it's what yeah. makes it yeah um and it's the beauty of it right which um w- which which i love and i think that that's that's um really really important for people to uh to understand that sometimes it's not always about getting big no no i don't you know? think so and yeah. i think it's one thing that trying to be a jack of all trades and doing every part of my business it's great to know how to do every part how to do your tax how to do mm. um your finishing your welding all that kind of stuff but i think there is a point where you have to decide what you're going to outsource i think that's quite a smart thing to do in business so the mm. things that i outsource now are all my powder coating and finishes all my upholstery i leave it to somebody else i go and collect it i know what they're going to do is is you know a good level of workmanship but it takes pressure off me and it's just about factoring that cost back in at the start. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be a key thing, I reckon, yeah. Know your limitations. Know your limitations. Do you consider yourself a, a perfectionist in any way? Uh, yeah, I think any maker that doesn't consider themselves a perfectionist. <laughs> They're lying. Um, <laughs> if I'm making something for a client, it will definitely be made to a higher level than if I'm making something for myself mm. because I'll try to I would rather make multiple pieces for myself than have a perfect, perfect piece of furniture, but a piece that's going to a client, if there's any flaws in it, I'll either fix it or remake it. Yeah, the, reason so it that, be the reason why I asked that question, because I knew a little something. I knew that mm-hmm. you were, you were, you wanted to always drop off the furniture to ensure that yeah. if, if, you know, it can't go in the hands of a potential delivery service, because who knows what happens then. Yeah, you know? I, I regularly drive pieces to Sydney, Adelaide, Canberra. Yeah. Um, and I, again, that's I think adding a level of customer without a doubt. Experience. You know, when they when they book a career, they're expecting TNT or someone to rock yep. up. But when you rock up with the piece, and they're mm. like, "Shit, yeah, you've actually made the effort to come here." And say, mm. and maybe I won't do that forever, but I would always like somebody within my business to do it rather than a career. Yeah. Kind. And I think that what's interesting about a lot of the work that you do is a lot of it is a story, right? The way that I see it, and I think that that's just part of it. You know, if this was sitting in my lounge room. The, the the fact that I could say, and he actually even brought it here himself, mm. you know, it, it's just got, you know, it's got that got that behind it. And I think that's really the different, that, that bespoke element, that yeah. um, that personalised touch, yeah. which is which is so important. I'll tell you something sneaky that we did. Well, maybe not sneaky, but... We're listening. Um, We're listening. <laughs> so I've got a maker's mark that I obviously brand onto the pieces. Mm. On the higher end pieces, it'll be discreet. It'll be hidden away. But what I'll do is if I'm making a large dining table for a client, I'll make them a cheese board or something with an off cut mm. and I'll put my brand front and center on it. Nice. So, you know, they're having a dinner party with friends. They're bringing their cheese out at the end of a meal yeah. and it's got my brand on it. People say, what are Soto Spear? Oh, they made this table. So it kind of makes it part wow. of the conversation. Nice. I like um, that. It's such a small, easy thing to do. But yeah. yeah. And it's those small touches, right? That people mm. really, they're like, well, let me tell you, you know, you got to speak to this guy. Mm. But yeah, that's, that's awesome. Over deliver. Yeah. yeah. Over deliver. Great sales tips here. Um, question for you, mm-hmm. um, when I, and I know I'm getting the heads up and we've got questions coming in, so yes. I just have a couple more questions. What's been the most satisfying piece for you to make and why? Um, it would probably be, I reckon, the Osberg bench. Okay. It was maybe only the fourth or fifth piece of furniture I'd ever made. Mm-hmm. It was clients who were friends mm-hmm. um, who wanted to help me get the business off the ground, yep. who had a good budget. Mm-hmm and no brief they said this is our space yeah. make us something 
get they creative. They literally did not know what it wanted to be. Wow. Um, so that was a huge challenge. Um, and I came up with a design that I was pretty happy with. I made it in my old workshop. So the piece is 3.6 meters long and weighs combined about 200 and 220 kilos. Wow. Uh, in three separate pieces. Wow. So it's a, making a 3.6 meter yeah. long piece in a four meter by four meter workshop is pretty tricky. Yeah. Um, and I've since made another one of those for, for a different client, but uh, not in the small workshop. Yeah. But it's oh, I will always have the connection back. How the hell did I make that piece yeah, in, yeah. in such a small space? And what is what you can accomplish, you know? Mm. People always want bigger spaces and bigger workshops, whereas that's my reminder that you can achieve a lot with not very much. Awesome, awesome. Um, so in wrapping up my questions, I think that one of the things that we often ask entrepreneurs when we're, we're in these discussions is, you know, you have a lot of down days, you got a lot of those days where you're just like, I can't be bothered getting out of bed and you, there's no one to really prod you, you know, I mean, a, a boss saying, where are you? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that you stay passionate about what you do and stay motivated and hungry to be here every single day? Um, obviously having my workspace uh, like, like this, yeah, it's a space that I want to be in, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it makes you feel good to mm -hmm. be here. But I think as well it's about there's certain jobs that you don't enjoy doing in business. If you're having a down day, don't do them. Yeah. You know, pick a bit that you really want to do. If you're feeling inspired, be creative, you know. I, I'm usually more creative late at night. So if I'm in a hyper creative mood, I will literally stay up all night and just sketch and design. And I think you've got to embrace those highs and lows and manage yourself accordingly. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm going to cut now and grab some of the questions that have come through. Thank you very much. That's a big pile we've got there, Lani. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Okay. First question. How do you keep customers engaged? Apart from social media, are there any other options you're considering? Apart from social media? Yeah. Um, probably site visits, getting them in to see their piece as it's sort of going through the various stages. Mm -hmm. um, why else would I keep them engaged? I, I feel like the question was saying, can we have an event of some description? We have, we have events. We have, you know, we try to do an annual gallery event. We go to trade shows and things like that. Okay. But um, yeah, yeah. Having, having your own event is a really good one. Um, yeah. To be at a, a trade shows is obviously pretty expensive. Mm. If you take that money and promote your own work, you might get 1% of the people that come, but that 1% are properly engaged cool. by your work. So the last one that I had, I had one client end up buying six pieces of furniture, which is more than I've ever sold when I've been at a trade show for less, less cost to me. Okay. Mm. This is a good one. Okay. Where do you get your ideas from? Apart from traveling, are there any other areas you explore to aspire ideas? Um, God, I don't know, like any form of visual arts, to be honest. I don't tend to look to other furniture designers for inspiration. You don't? No. Okay. I find that, I mean, if you start to, you'll start to subconsciously absorb their work. Right. And it's easy to then produce pieces that might look pretty similar. Okay. And IP is an important thing, you know, I've had my work ripped off in a, in a couple of um, countries, which I won't name, mm -hmm. but um, I think it's really important that my work is my work. So it might not be direct, this is what a piece of furniture looks like that I enjoy. It'll be more, I'll look to people like chefs and creatives and independent musicians and the way they market themselves mm -hmm. and the whole brand that they create. Mm. I get more enthused by that, right. especially chefs. You know, right. they've got a limited palette of materials yep. that you or I yep. could have access to, but it's the order in which they cook them mm. is what makes them mm. far and above what we could. Yeah, so interesting. So you're actually grabbing inspiration from, a, well, I, I would argue a chef is an artist themselves, yeah. and taking that and and then creating something, <laughs> creating furniture and pieces out of that. That's so cool. Yeah, awesome. That's that's really interesting. It's kind of this almost. This next question. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, well, it's a similar. Um, we've got here, how do you come up with your practical ideas? For example, the side tables with the book holders. Is that just from your experience or are these ideas from your customers? 
Uh, sometimes they'll be from customers, but generally when I'm trying to, so I'll have a piece that will be, the majority will be timber and I'll try to add in another material. So that other material might come in in the form of brass or leather inlay or an object. So like a found object, mm -hmm. but I'll always try to avoid putting in things like tech, you know, I like put in an iPhone dock. Mm -hmm. What's the point in a year that, that iPhone dock isn't going to work? So I would look to things like wine and books, things that are going to be around for the next hundred years as being more practical to um, bring into my furniture and make it make it functional. Because mm -hmm. I mean, form folders function and all that kind of stuff, but I recognize that my furniture is sharp edged. So it's about how you can add function to soften the piece nearly. Mm. Mm. Interesting. This one here um, from one of our students. How do you manage key person dependency? Key I'd love to say I know what key person dependency means. <laughs> I, what I understand that the, the, the student is asking this, mm -hmm. managing yourself. Managing myself? Yeah. Um, so I, I, <laughs> I do have interns that work for me as well. So okay. I'll generally have one intern working at a time. So I do have somebody to manage and to nearly, not to train, but to mm -hmm. sort of show how my pieces have been imagined and how they're put together. Mm. Um, so, I don't know, the interns that I have, I think it's important that I don't just put them on sanding duty for seven weeks, you know. Mm. I want to explain how I have formed my business. Yeah. I think it's really important, that camaraderie, that eventually they will go and form their own business maybe, and I'd like to have a good relationship with them. I'd like. Uh, them to not have to make the same, same mistakes I've done in terms of quoting and pricing early on so that uh, the whole industry is self-sustainable a little bit more rather mm. than people under quoting to get jobs. Um, but yeah, I think it's just motivation really, finding out what they like mm -hmm. um, and knowing what I like. Mm -hmm. So trying to keep myself motivated in the business. Mm. You, you just touched on something quickly and I just want to, because I know there'll be people interested in, in knowing this. Mm. Do you actually, tell us a bit about your, you, you do take interns here. I do, yeah. yeah tell us a little bit like, that. like how, did they, how do they find you? What, what's the setup? Lani's telling me we've got more questions. Okay. More questions, <laughs> yeah. okay. Answer this one, Keep we've got another ahead. one as well. Um, we'll allow it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> I get about 50 to 60 emails per week of people looking for work from all sorts of industries, similar to my background where they're fed up with desk job and, yep. wanna, and they wanna get into a creative industry versus graduates who are just panicking and just jumping for work. But um, the key I would say for any anybody applying for an internship or employment is have a good folio, you know? No matter, even if you haven't made a piece of furniture, if you're capable of rendering something in CAD or learning software to design, to sketch, to photograph things, like have something that makes me want to open it. Okay. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. I don't mm -hmm. look for, people who specifically know how to use machinery, like mm. that can be taught. Whereas I think having a creative mind is something that's learned pretty early on. Yeah. You know, if you don't have a creative mind, I can't teach you how to be creative. Yeah. So my interns have come from, one was a furniture design school um, in Germany, one was a product designer from RMIT, and the other one is creative arts. Yeah. Um, she comes from, she's a baller, ballerina. Wow. So you'd say, how are the two put together? But it's she has a creative mind. Yes. Um, and that's that's what I look for. Cool. Yeah. There you go. I've um, got a question here. Would you rather work with a full brief, knowing exactly what the client wants, or no brief, where you can where you can bulk of the design work is conceptualised by yourself and not the client? It's a really tricky one. Um, okay. I probably like some middle ground. So if a client approaches me and says, I have no idea what I, what I want, I'll generally send them, say, go out on the internet, send me images of things that you like. And that's not, I won't copy it off the internet, but it'll give me a base point of understanding of the aesthetics that they like. And then I'll put, try to put my own twist on it. You know, I'll assume that they like my existing work, so they're not gonna hate what I've designed for them. So once that big idea comes, it's just about tweaking rather than complete redesigns. But a client that has real fixed ideas of what they want can be pretty tricky sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, like, I prefer collaborating. I yep. prefer a back and forth rather than, this is what I want, give it to make, me. Make me this. Quote it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's not what I see my strengths being. Like, I, 
I like the bouncing of ideas. Right. Yeah, so probably somewhere in between the two. Cool. Uh, question here. Mm -hmm. What is your average acquisition cost for each customer? Um, so my social media cost? Yeah, I think that's it's around okay. marketing spend. Um, I would say I probably spend about $40, something like that, mm -hmm. in terms of online spend. So okay. I try to make sure that my um, natural Instagram posts that I'm not boosting and stuff like that, that they have good reach. Mm -hmm. So that's instantly going to put you in front of more eyes. Mm. I do use Google AdWords. I do SEO on my yep. website. but. My cost in terms of that is quite low, yep. but my costs in the background of time that I spend prototyping things, of trade shows that I go to, that's where big costs are, are hidden. Yeah, but, right. Yeah, my cost per client in terms of just marketing budget for mm. online marketing is relatively low. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Th this question is, is, is uh, in the same ilk, if you will. Okay. Uh, how do you price your furniture, not just for your time, but for your creativity? Um, it's a pretty tricky one, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so I recently did an episode of Ask Sawdust. So on my Instagram, you can yep. go to it. And uh, I got a bit of trolling um, and somebody said to me, how the, can a chair cost a thousand dollars? So I wanted to be upfront and honest. So I said, right, I'm gonna go through my pricing. So I showed them the exact material cost, the exact number of hours of labor, the GST, the margin, the overheads, and this is how I arrive at that cost. Yeah, I'm not trying to make, like people assume that because my furniture is at a high end yep. and I'm making a huge margin on it. Mm -hmm. These pieces take weeks or months to make sometimes. So it's about when it's a new piece and I'm still learning on it, I know it's gonna take longer to make it the first time. Mm -hmm. So I don't pass those charges onto the customer. I put mm -hmm. them on me. But then the next time I know that I can increment that piece up because it's gonna be better quality. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna make it in fewer hours. So then I'm gonna make more of a margin. But um, yeah. That's, it's, it's a really difficult, quoting and yeah. pricing, if you ask any maker, that is the number one. That's the tough one. Yeah, it is. And mm. um, trying to get people to buy into your vision. Mm. So have a strong brand, you know, yeah. whether it's your own name or a business name, it's about getting people to believe in it and making them believe you're worth that much. Showing mm. them the, the difference between going to Ikea and nothing wrong with Ikea, but um, going to Ikea and buying a piece that you might have for two or three years before the veneer starts flaking off it, yeah. versus buying a chair that is going to last them, their family, beyond them. Yeah. It's gonna be around for you know 100 years. Yeah. Um, so when you then look at cost that way, it's, it's not that expensive. Mm -hmm. Excellent, yeah. cool. Well, thank you very much, Brian. It's yeah, so anything. insightful, once again, Thank you for having us in, in, your, in your studio here in the workshop yeah. uh, at the Sawdust Bureau. Um, everyone at home, thank you very much for tuning in. Again, next month uh, we'll be doing another Entrepreneur with Dessert. Um, we're actually, for those, who are, uh, we've, for those interested in social enterprises, I really recommend you tune in. We've got a great, um, a great interview lined up for next month and you'll get all the information. We'll send it out to you shortly. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Have a wonderful night. Uh, I'm Oscar. This is Brian. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers, Oscar. Awesome. Cheers, Cheers mate. Man. Thanks.